Hello, Politics Plus Media 101 listeners. Today, Justin and I are going to have a discussion about current events, especially in U.S. domestic politics. We've had a number of excellent guests in the last couple of weeks, so we figured it was about time that we sit together and have one of our own discussions. Justin, I know that you were keen to comment on a story that has taken up really an incredible amount of media attention here in the United States, and that's the story of these, I suppose they're UFOs? unidentified flying objects, terrestrial or otherwise, that have been, in the last several days, routinely shot down by the American security services. So this is a story that I haven't been following probably quite as closely as you. I think there's been a little bit too much of it, but everyone is talking about this. So sometimes even a story that's not that important can end up mattering if it changes the way important actors in politics or the media or the electorate are responding to them. So let's talk about it. Justin, what should we make of this suddenly routine incident? Yeah. So first off, John, when you live in the nation's capital and you hear that there are UFOs flying over military sites across the country, you get a little bit worried because you don't know if that next flash of light is going to be a welcome present from Russia. And that may be it. Uh, I say that tongue in cheek. But this is a serious story for a variety of reasons. Just to give a recap, a couple of weeks ago, we had a balloon that started in Canada, Alaska, traveled over Montana, crossed most of our country, including some key military installations. And we ultimately shot it down in South Carolina waters to retrieve the balloon itself. That was the first of these UFOs. That balloon, we think, is a Chinese spy mechanism. We're not 100% sure, but we are sure that it is indeed a balloon. The other balloons that we know about, which aren't balloons, Sean, to your point, they're UFOs because we really don't know how they were propelled and they don't look like a balloon, according to DOD and pilots that actually saw these things. We shot them all down as well. One was off the coast of Alaska. One was in Canada over the Yukon and most recently Lake Huron near Michigan in that area. And we shot all of these down relatively quickly. So I think there are a few things to understand here. Number one, you're going to hear people who have partisan interests either praising or attacking the administration for their actions. So let's take a look. The first balloon was allowed to travel all the way from Alaska to South Carolina, across the country, the length of the country. And the reasoning was a few things. Number one, they didn't want to shoot it down and create civilian injuries in areas where they didn't really have the ability to mitigate those things with near certainty. Number two, the administration, this was the first one, they wanted to see how this thing was traveling, see how it was acting, and gather our own intelligence. Number three, reportedly, we also went through a process of blocking any type of information gathering or communication that this balloon could do to put us at risk from a security perspective. So that is to say, the balloon was allowed to travel across the country because it wasn't a threat. We were able to block everything and we wanted to gather our own intelligence. So that stands out as, in my view, a very prudent thing for the military and President Biden to do. Oh, lastly, John, and I think that this proves their point, they didn't want to shoot this balloon off the coast of Alaska because it's very difficult to capture materials that are shot down in those waters as evidenced by the second balloon that was shot down over the coast of Alaska. We can't find the debris and we're not currently able to actually collect that debris. So I think the Biden administration in the first instance acted really properly. I noticed what you said about how people in Washington, D.C. might respond to an aerial threat because of consciousness that D.C. would be a target if a foreign country were to attack the United States. And I thought that that was kind of interesting and how we look at this, because it brings to mind stories that I've heard about the Cold War and the mindset that Americans had at that time when there was really a sense of acute threat. The the idea that at any moment, Russia, at the time the Soviet Union, could attack the United States even with nuclear weapons and how instead of active shooter drills in school, people learned how to do bomb drills, how 
the situation that was famously satirized in Dr. Strangelove of mutually assured destruction was something that felt very plausible. But how, especially at times like the Cuban Missile Crisis, the United States really did come pretty close to being attacked in the homeland in key strategic areas by a foreign adversary. This is so different from the environment that you and I grew up in in the years after the Cold War ended. We have had this sense of security. Of course, there's been aberrations like the September 11th attacks that took one of my family members. But generally, we're not living in a sense of constant and acute threat. This is a sense of security that people in other parts of the world don't have the luxury of. If you're living in Syria, in parts of Iraq, even Turkey, and certainly in Ukraine today, as well as other places like uh, certain parts of Ethiopia the last few years, um, in uh, parts of Colombia, in parts of Libya, there is a sense that at any time your home could get attacked. Uh, I know certainly in um, Afghanistan and Pakistan, this was something that has been part of ordinary daily experiences for the last 20 years. To the extent that I heard from some acquaintances of mine the, from Pakistan, that some Pakistani families were hoping that their house would get hit because they knew friends and neighbors who had had their houses hit and were getting government subsidies to build a new house. In the United States, we haven't been living under this kind of fear. And if this pseudo Cold War with China really does escalate and the sabers rattle more and more, knowing that China is a nuclear armed nation, it is possible that that kind of fear that we experienced during the Cold War and that others have been experiencing since is something that could return to daily life in America. But it's another reason why we should try as best as we can to prevent that from happening. And it's it's really important. Well, first off, having the biggest and best and most expensive military, the best technology, probably the best trained soldiers should afford you a, a sense of security, especially with the borders that we have, the neighbors that we have to the north and south, east and west being vast bodies of water. Um, so, so I do think that it's all relative, right? But I think that what you're hitting on is a very important point why I think this is a serious issue, not for the reasons that the media is covering it, John. One of the criticisms from the Biden administration is we heard about three of these balloons from other sources, not the US government. And my take on this thing is I personally don't need to know everything that is going on in our national security apparatus. I am very glad that our citizens don't know everything that is going on in our national security apparatus from uh, special missions overseas to stuff happening here at home. And one thing that is very concerning is that now people are looking for the smallest things that are out of whack or maybe a UFO, whether it be alien or Chinese or whatever their imaginations can cook up. And I don't think we should have 100% transparency on all of this stuff because what happens is what you just described, the way that the media has been covering this serious issue is there's been a mix of sensationalization with UFOs and aliens, tongue in cheek stuff, but folks like Marjorie Taylor Greene or other Republicans saying it could be a bioweapon that the Chinese are sending over America and they're going out there, they're going on the airwaves and they are telling their constituents or the news anchors or the commentary people are telling their viewers and their listeners Basically, to be scared shitless, this could be an attack from China. And from my perspective, John, this is one of the most important things of this whole saga, is that if you continue to have this environment, this is only one way on the escalation scale, and it's up, and it's to the second or third largest nuclear power in the world. Speaking about America's geographical position, we often remark about how the United States is blessed to have good neighbors. Mexico and Canada, who are allies, and then also the island nations of the Caribbean, some of whom are allies and friends. I think that we should note, though, that our neighbors have not always been our friends and allies. Historically, they've sometimes been our enemies. We've been at war with Canada twice uh, during the American Revolution and during the War of 1812. We twice invaded Canada and we were defeated twice by Canada. 
We've been at war with Mexico. We fought a major territorial war over Mexico that led to a complete redrawing of national boundaries. We've also been at war with Cuba when Cuba were a colony of Spain. And then also after Cuba became an independent country and had their revolution in the 1950s. So it's not a default scenario that our neighbors are good neighbors in the sense that we have peace with them. But we've worked hard to make sure that we do have good relations and stable relations with our neighbors. And that's the most important thing for security, isn't it? Today, we have the uh, what was called NAFTA and is now the USMCA, a free trade agreement that's integrated the economies of Mexico, Canada, and the United States to build a peaceful and productive trading relationship between the three countries. We've worked pretty hard to isolate Cuba and to reduce the security risk that came from Cuba in the 1960s. So a lot of diplomatic and security work has gone into making sure that our neighbors don't threaten us. It's not a default scenario that we have good neighbors. Geography is important, but geography in the way that we interpret it for security is also impacted by the human factor and the political developments. In the Arctic, we are quite close to Russia, who are not in any way a friend and partner. And also, um, as we've seen here, China, who are not exactly a neighbor of the United States, um, they have the ability to reach us through devices like this in an age where security becomes interstellar. Certainly, having a land border with the countries we do isn't going to mean that we're not potentially threatened by parties from further afield. So we should keep in mind that security matters no matter who we are next to at any given time. Speaking about this recent turn of events, though, I think what is remarkable, really kind of noticeable here is after the media sensation of the first balloon, the speed and frequency at which we've been announcing the uh, shooting down of these other objects. I think it raises a question of how common these objects had already been appearing in our airspace and it going unremarked by the media. If we have had new public interest on this topic, and then in the next week, all of a sudden, we're taking action against many objects. I mean, it really does raise a question. What, has it always been ordinary for there to be these kinds of objects floating? And then one, did the United States tolerate them and not take action for a long time? Or two, actually shoot down many of these objects routinely without announcing it publicly? I don't really know the answer to any of these questions. I think the answer is number one, yes. This is fairly common, and Senator Gillenbrand was on CNN giving an interview about it and how they passed a law that would prevent the discrimination of U.S. service members from reporting UFOs because folks basically used to report UFOs similar to the balloons over Lake Huron and the Alaska coast saying, we see this thing. We don't know how it's propelled. It's not clearly a balloon. It's very bizarre to us. And even in cases, they'd say it was interfering with their mechanical signals on their planes, like these last two balloons, some Air Force pilots were basically making that claim. So yes, it it is something that has happened. And something interesting is after the balloon, the original balloon that was shot over South Carolina went down, the US changed the way we are interacting with the raw data from our radar systems and whatever the technology is that monitors our our airspace, because I'm sure it's more than just traditional uh, radar. And what they've done is they've they're looking through the raw data, according to the experts that are out there talking about this, in a more fine-toothed comb way. So they're actually catching more things. And it's almost like a paradigm shift that that is happening. And I think that it's very important that we both do make these changes. We upgrade the way we're able to monitor our airspace. But I also think that not all of this should be made public. And once we do figure out what's going on, uh, we should put the public tensions and concerns to rest uh, and go about dealing with these things in a more private manner. Because specifically, John, the prevailing theory is that it's most likely either a foreign or domestic company, university, nonprofit 
scientific research mission for the other three balloons that aren't necessarily espionage or a threat to our airspace. It's just, we didn't know they were up there. We found them. We sent out folks to look at them and then we shot them down. If the U.S. are responding to the media interest and public attention on the first balloon by changing our security policy in this regard and getting much more aggressive about how we approach these items when they're identified. It does kind of raise some concern about how a potential escalation in U.S.-China relations might be handled, right? We often talk about miscalculations and misunderstandings, uh, misinterpretations, and how that can be, a, you know, an escalating security risk. What I think we're all hoping is that in a South China Sea, in a Pacific Ocean, where the U.S. and China are increasingly hostile and mistrusting of each other's intentions, that misinterpretation wouldn't lead to a cascading crisis of overreaction. Um, and I think that that's something that maybe we should be a little bit more concerned about after watching this sequence of events, right? And to your point, officials from Taiwan came out and they're like, oh yeah, China does this all the time to us. There's espionage balloons over our waters, over our land all the time. So that is a big concern if you have US aircraft carriers near the South China Sea, in the South China Sea, near Taiwan. The concern for just a mess up right? Your standard human error where we're all on edge is heightened, obviously, John. So so my takeaway from this whole thing is, number one, we obviously need to strengthen the way that we go about monitoring our airspace. That's important. Number two, the media, even maybe President Biden, everybody needs to take a step back and try and tone things down. We don't need James Comer, who's, I believe, the head of oversight going out there saying China is sending over a biomedical weapon over our airspace. That's Is there any basis? Do we know if there's any basis for that kind of claim? No. And the claim was made, John, just like Tucker Carlson makes claims on his shows. I'm just asking the question. And then they throw out this ridiculous question, which scares a lot of people, especially when it's a high ranking Republican official who's a sitting member of Congress, right? You assume that they have some type of basis behind their claim other than trying to score partisan points or scare their electorate into voting for them. So number one, we need to do better on the air. Number two, everybody needs to tone down their rhetoric. Uh, And number three, I think that we need to continue to look for ways to de-escalate potential conflicts with China because there were reports during the first balloon when it was flying over the United States, the Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin reached out to his counterpart in the Chinese government to make a phone call to figure out what's going on, and they just ignored the call. So in this instance, That's okay, but if you take a step back and look at the way that our rhetoric towards China will just continue to increase and potentially get out of hand, these deconfliction lines are vital. So, John, to your point, it isn't UFOs. We didn't need to spend this much time on it in the media, but there are some serious trends here that we need to take care of and get control of. Yeah, I mean, this brings to mind some discussions that we've had in this program about the South China Sea. Uh, We had Greg Poling from CSIS talking about research that they did about the maritime militias that China were using some commercial vessels as supplements to their military apparatus about uh, how when observed through that lens, we can observe that the South China Sea is getting more militarized. And there's been plenty of stuff in the news about disputes over islands in the South China Sea where uh, China have been militarizing some of the islands and expanding them artificially. And their control over some of them is not recognized by other countries who have taken it to international fora, won the dispute, and have then been just ignored by the Chinese. This is at the same time as we recognize how important the South China Sea and also the Malacca Straits are for the global economy, about how an enormous percentage of the world's GDP, the world's total imports and exports are flowing through those zones. Uh, So the stakes are really high and the 
risks of miscalculation are enormous. And in a situation like that, where some of the most important parts of the planet are under increasing militarization and an increasing environment of mistrust, that's where we have to be incredibly careful. And seeing the way this is all unfolded does raise some concerns about what might happen if there was a misunderstanding or, uh, I mean, even a, a, rec- a genuine recognition of problematic behavior in that area and how important it is to have a line of communication to de-escalate. We were talking about this with uh, Noah Smith, and he pointed out during the so- uh, Cold War, the U.S. and the Soviet Union did have lines of communication to try to avoid crises like those. What was it the red phone or something where the leaders or other security officials could communicate with each other to prevent escalation in a situation like that one? And so as we move further along this path, uh, we can only really hope and advocate for those kinds of safeguards being in place. And it's really an important topic, the reason why we focus so much on it, because at this time in the world right now, John, I think it's unequivocal that a lot of the higher GDP countries are remilitarizing, right? We see it across Europe with commitments to the 3% GDP spend for NATO members. Other countries that aren't a part of NATO in Europe are spending more on military assets and strategies, and they're redoubling their efforts, which makes sense. Uh, but also we see it in Japan. We see it in South Korea. It's it's happening almost all over the world. So I think when we have these conversations about potential military conflicts, military issues, the way you started out is a sober one. We need to also focus on diplomacy. Yeah. I mean, Japan, I think was the first example I thought of when you mentioned that, you know, they're moving off of their historical post-World War II policy and Australia are another Asia Pacific country that are focused on uh, defense procurement in some notable cases like the AUKUS deal. And, you know, thinking about my old home in the Arabian Gulf or the Persian Gulf, as it's alternatively labeled. Uh, we know that the countries in that area are very keen on armament and they're uh, pursuing increasing defense procurements with the consent of the United States, notably, which they had not previously had in, in some key instances, at the same time as their rival and neighbor, Iran, are looking as unstable and uh, unreliable an actor as ever. So there's many flashpoints around the world. And um, as much as we've done since World War II to prevent cycles of violence emerging from these tense areas that we're able to recognize and predict, we have to remain increasingly conscious of the consequences of, of escalation. Some of my Republican friends want to take the economy hostage. I get it. Unless I agree to their economic plans. All of you at home should know what those plans are. Instead of making the wealthy pay their fair share, some Republicans, some Republicans want Medicare and Social Security to sunset. I'm not saying it's a majority. Let me give you, anybody who doubts it, contact my office. I'll give you a copy. I'll give you a copy of the proposal. That means Congress doesn't vote. I'm glad to see you. No, I tell you, I, I enjoy conversion. You know, it means if, if Congress doesn't keep the programs the way they are, they go away. Other Republicans say, I'm not saying it's a majority of you. I don't even think it's even a significant. But it's being proposed by individuals. I'm not politely not naming them, but it's being proposed by some of you. Look, folks. The idea is that we're not going to be we're, we're not going to be moved into being threatened to default on the debt if we don't respond, folks. So, folks, as we all apparently agree. Social Security and Medicare is off the, off the books now, right? They're not to be stopped. 
So, John, let's talk about the third rail of politics here in the United States of America, which is a metaphor, a symbol for if you touch this third rail of politics, your political career is dead. That is cutting Social Security and Medicare. During President Biden's recent State of the Union address, he brought up the claim that Republicans either want to sunset the programs or cut them, to which more like a UK parliamentary proceeding with the prime minister, the GOP got very upset. They started booing and President Biden touched off this interaction between the president and the GOP. So, Mr. Gunnison, I think this is a very, very big and important problem for the Republican Party because of a few reasons, but I'm going to kick it over to you after just describing what these programs are. So here in the United States, our social safety net is really undergirded by these programs, which is Medicare. It is basically healthcare, universal healthcare for elderly folks. Social Security is basically a universal basic income for elderly folks. And the theory is You work your whole life, you pay taxes into the government and specifically into these programs. You deserve to receive your benefits when you reach a certain age. And as a result, you deserve a certain dignity and quality of life from these programs. So ultimately, John, these are the two most arguably important spending programs to the U.S. voter uh, that there are. What, What are your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, so Social Security, like a public pension for retired persons, and then Medicare, less national health care for retired persons and more like national health insurance for retired persons. And just like you said, these are the cornerstones of the welfare state of the United States, both introduced in the mid 20th century, Social Security as part of the New Deal with Franklin Roosevelt, and Medicare as part of the sort of Great Society series of reforms to the welfare state under President Lyndon Johnson. I want to mention another explanation for why Social Security is justified and and valued so highly. Part of the rationale uh, is inflation. So we're talking about how people work their whole lives and deserve dignity. Part of why that's difficult is if you're working in your 30s and saving money, as you go on in life in your career, by the time of retirement, that money is not worth quite as much because of inflation that's an active part of U.S. monetary policy, right? I mean, the U.S. government are deliberately decreasing the value of what you save. Um, I, we had Michael Strain on recently. He was talking about how the Federal Reserve targets a 2% inflation rate. They, they intend for inflation. So, it, it, we do owe it to retired person in the United States to make sure that they have the retirement they deserve because the money that they've saved throughout their career doesn't have the same value that it that it, it would without that aspect of U.S. public policy, right? I think there's a lot to talk about here. It's going to have pretty big political implications, and it has for decades. It's always been a huge part of, of our domestic politics. But I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about that moment that you referred to, because I think it is an interesting thing to talk about. I like the comparison you made to the UK House of Commons, but how the State of the Union started resembling that because of the jeers and responses we were getting from members during the speech. And with that in mind, I think that we can probably not be so precious about our indignity that some kind of heckling occurred. I remember, I think it was during the 2010 or was it the 2011 State of the Union address, even 2009, one of Obama's first State of the Union addresses, uh, he was heckled famously by a gentleman, I believe in South Carolina, named Joe Wilson, a member of Congress, who shouted at him, you lie, during the speech. And you could tell that Obama was quite offended by this, as were many in the political commentariat. It was received as being a disgraceful moment in the history of the United States Congress. And it really stood out, and we still remember it so many years later. It's funny watching what happened the other night with that in mind, that controversy in mind, because 
it appears to have been a much more extreme iteration of something very similar. Instead of just one person shouting something, it was pretty sustained heckling by a large number of people. But I think that perhaps we don't need to be quite as offended by this as we were then and as some are now. When we do think of that comparison to the UK House of Commons, we can recognize that you know this is actually a quite normal part of politics. I, I don't want to see the US Congress go as far as they go over there and to see us uh, descend into a situation where there is no dignity or respect at all in the uh, convening of Congress, especially during the State of the Union. It's also an important distinction that our president is a head of state. So with that office, there's a bit more dignity and respect that should be associated with it than what the prime minister has, who is not the head of state. But I think that we can recognize that that kind of participatory lively atmosphere is something that can be a understood and acknowledged part of the process. Another important reason why I think we don't need to be so offended is that the president clearly was not offended himself. And in fact, he seemed to really enjoy the moment and uh, the opportunity to have a little bit of a back and forth. And that reflects his personality, which is quite different from President Obama's. But also, I think his recognition, even in the moment, that the way that the Republicans started trying to heckle him was something incredibly beneficial to the White House, uh, because it ensured that this clip was the clip that would be talked about the next day and the next week. When you give a long address, I think, what was it, 90 minutes long? It was over an hour. It was a long address. When you give a long address like that, you're not sure which moments are going to be discussed or even remembered. I would challenge people to try to remember any moment from any of Donald Trump's State of the Union addresses. But because of that instance of heckling, the Republicans who chose to do so guaranteed that that particular clip was going to make its way into the news and into the public awareness and memory. And I think that the White House would be very pleased and are very pleased by which clip that was, because it was a clip in which Biden was talking about an area of great political strength for Democrats and great political weakness for the Republicans. These attacks on the most popular welfare programs in the United States. And the Republicans who chose to draw so much attention to this topic I do not think have served their uh, party's uh, political strategy very well. Yeah. So just quickly want to get into whether it's okay or not to have the booing, the heckling, you know, maybe you lie or you're a liar is a bit over the top, which I think you'd agree with because it's more ad hominem than attacking an idea. For example, I think that it is great. I think that the booing and the interaction between the president and the members of Congress is fantastic. I think that ultimately we don't have this silly, foolish idea of a king or queen dictating to us what the State of the Union is and how it's going to go. We have a duly elected president that was literally created because we didn't want a king or a queen. Um, And I think that you can afford dignity to the office in a way that also shows polite maybe crossing the line into not so polite opposition. And I think that it also, so that's the first point. This is great. Love more of it. Let's just, you know, keep it within the bounds of respect. I think, which is the point that you were making, John. Now onto the substance of it, like you said, I can really only remember one moment during President Trump's State of the Union address, and it was because of how big of a deal the Republicans made of it, was Nancy Pelosi tearing up the speech after the State of the Union, can't remember one quote from it. I remember they, they, they were rather dark in nature and tone and a little bit scary, depending on how you see the world. It was over the top. Probably Stephen Miller was writing them, but it was Pelosi's like, oh, I'm done with this. And she tore it up. So that is to say my, my third point here is that it was a big winner. 
for President Biden, because this is the only thing that we're going to remember from this speech today. We will remember it in 2024. You can guarantee it's going to be some type of campaign commercial. Uh, And also, like you said, John, he ultimately got the better of the Republicans for a few reasons. Number one, they attack him for his mental acuity, his dexterity, his ability to think on his feet. And he came out there, had an unscripted back and forth, which truly was unprecedented for a state of the union since, I don't know, maybe FDR began having these when they were in the public attention. So so it showed that he is competent. And then also it took a plank of American politics, the third rail of politics, and you position President Biden because of his own doing here and interacting with the Republicans as the staunch defender of Social Security and Medicare. So for all older voters, 65 and over, they see this clip, it's going to be, I promise to defend these benefits as President Biden and then in interaction with the Republicans, where ultimately his point won. Um, And then the third reason why it was so effective, John, is President Biden used this moment in the speech and Republicans helped him probably unwittingly do so. And after the speech on cable news and outlets, it's just been a constant theme of Democratic opposition research highlighting Republican members of Congress who are in the recent past advocating for sunsetting, which is ultimately ending, or cutting Social Security and Medicare. And now the face of the Republican Party are both the hecklers like Marjorie Taylor Greene, because they're going to get a lot of airtime, and folks like Rick Scott, who legitimately proposed in 2022 before the midterm elections that moving forward, his focus would be to cut spending. And one way he would do that is to sunset Medicare and Medicaid and all federal programs in every five years. Big winner for Biden. The example that you gave of Nancy Pelosi tearing up the speech is such an excellent example to illustrate the points that we've been trying to make that I'm almost upset that I didn't think of it myself. Another moment of partisan heckling, you could characterize it as during State of the Union addresses. And this is then the only thing that we remember from any of them, isn't it? The only thing we remember from Obama's State of the Union addresses, apparently, is Joe Wilson saying, you lie. The only thing we remember from Trump's is Nancy Pelosi ripping up the speech. And the only thing we remember from Biden's is Marjorie Taylor Greene and others shouting that he was a liar and him having a humorous exchange with them. I think maybe George W. Bush, I believe the axis of evil quote came from a State of the Union address. So maybe that's the last time that we remember anything uh, that was said by the president and not by the audience in a state of the union. But John, that just makes your point yeah. because you got to realize, go put yourself in that frame. We were under attack. We were under attack as a country and it took that moment of extreme circumstance to create a one line of a speech that we ultimately remember. So to your point, uh, it's rather rare that we remember anything from these speeches. And I think that David Frum and Michael Gerson have both claim that they did not come up with that phrase because uh, it, it its reputation is aged so poorly. But uh, getting back to the substance of, of all of this, Medicare and Social Security, have, as we've been saying, are, are so enormous to American politics. I believe that the percentage of people that are on Medicare, it would surprise a lot of Americans. Um, we know that the baby boom generation are going into the retirement age now, and that's created a big population bubble of people that are going to be relying on on these programs. Over 83 million on Medicare alone. 83 million. It's also by far the most expensive thing that the US government does. Some people have come to me and they've showed me charts and said, look, the defense budget is 60% of the US budget. And I have to keep telling them, guys, you are looking at discretionary spending only. Please show the whole picture. If you add in the non-discretionary spending, then you will see that Medicare is by far the most expensive thing that the US government does. We spend a lot more money on healthcare, public money in the United States than we do on defense. I think the total defense uh, percentage, it goes from over 50 down to like 10 to 13 percent when you add in that non-discretionary spending, and you can see how it's just absolutely dwarfed 
by these uh, retirement programs, including that health insurance program. We spend more on health care uh, as a percentage of GDP uh, in public money, I think, than, than most uh, countries that uh, extend the benefits for under 65s as well. So it's really an enormous part of of what we do as a government. You know, what does the U.S. government do? Medicare. <laughs> the other thing is that because of the political dynamics of the issue, it has affected outcomes in, in elections or at, has kept the playing field very, very competitive because the Democrats strength in this issue has really bolstered them among seniors. In other countries, we see how conservative or center right parties do really well with elderly voters, where they're winning them by large percentages. I don't have any numbers to share with you right now, but in the UK, for example, the part of the reason the Tories have been so successful is because they do quite well with older voters. Whereas in the United States, because Democrats have strength on the issues that matter so much to seniors, they're very competitive with seniors. In, in the 2000 election, I believe that the Democrats actually won the senior vote. And in the last election cycle in 2020, Kellyanne Conway, who is a famous pollster who worked for Trump, was raising the alarm bells in the White House and in the campaign about how Trump was doing poorly with seniors. And this was a bigger problem than the Republicans were willing to acknowledge. And I believe that Trump may have barely won seniors, but Biden came very close to winning seniors. And that really uh, has a big impact across the whole country in lots of different races. We see that center left parties in other countries in, in Europe and so on have been performing poorly for the last several decades, whereas in the United States, the Democrats are much more successful than those other center left parties. And that's partly because there's this big partisan gap on the most important entitlement programs. Something that we should note is that during the Obama presidency in particular, when the Republicans had a very libertarian personality on welfare programs, on public spending, many Republican candidates have expressed positions and taken votes that demonstrate a hostility or skepticism of these programs. Also, during the Bush years, George W. Bush proposed privatizing Social Security, and he spent political capital on trying to make it happen and did not succeed. So from that instance, plus from the Obama years and the austerity and libertarian-minded Republicans like Paul Ryan, who wanted to reform these programs, we see that there is a pattern of Republican skepticism to these popular programs, and that has really weakened them politically. Yeah, and I, th and I think it's important to point that out because the Republican refrain was nearly unanimous, not unanimous though, that President Biden was lying, that Republicans don't want to cut Social Security, don't want to cut Medicare. And there are a few reasons why this claim itself is a lie. Number one, when you're looking at a politician and their priorities, what they say after their last election is not their whole public statement. It's not their record, right? Uh, just because a politician from November 10th, 2022 to, to February 13th, 2023 hasn't espoused a desire to cut Social Security and cut Medicare – doesn't mean that their past statements are invalidated, right? So that that's the that's point number one. Point number two, you hit on it with the big funding from discretionary to mandatory. If you are a Republican and you want to balance a budget in 10 years, which means the government spending and the government revenue ultimately balance out, then the way to go about this, it's almost impossible without looking at reforming Medicare and Social Security and cutting those two programs rather drastically. So just from a logical standpoint, you hear Republicans saying we need a 10-year balanced budget. You're not going to be able to do that without substantial reforms uh, to these programs. And then the third reason why the Republicans are lying here is because of their own words. In 2022, Rick Scott was the head of the Republican senatorial campaign arm, and he released a plan a couple months before an election stating that he wants to cut these programs through a sunset mechanism. The reason why you have a sunset mechanism is it's really hard to reauthorize things through Congress. So if you can't reauthorize things through Congress, 
you're going to end up cutting things. And that will result in cutting the program. He went on CNN and all the news stations after the State of the Union, and he firmed up his support for that plan. Another, uh, just a fact of life, Mitch McConnell himself, after the State of the Union, basically threw Rick Scott under the bus saying, yes, he released this silly plan that would have cut Social Security and Medicare. It makes no sense. And Rick Scott is going to have trouble in his next re-election bid in Florida. Maybe it's a primary, maybe it's a general election against Democrats, but he made a mistake. Um, And then lastly, here you have other members of the Republican House, of the Republican Senate, going and making claims that they would love to cut Medicare and Social Security. Matt Gates on the House side comes up. And then you had Senator Mike Rounds, a Republican, also go on CNN and Jake Tapper saying he believes all federal programs should sunset in one year, not five years, one year, which would leave these programs up to cuts. So that is all to say what President Biden said is not only logically accurate, if you understand the evolution of the GOP over the last few decades, their stance in the budget, but it's also literally accurate because Republicans have come out after the speech espousing the views that Biden said that they support. So I think it's really important that we parse through the partisan back and forth to just say that there are a number of Republicans that truly believe in cutting these programs as evidenced by their own words, John. I'm trying to find a quote and I don't think I'll be able to find it, but to illustrate your point about how if your goal is to balance the budget, you almost have to look at these programs. I recall a Republican politician saying that his attitude about Medicare and Social Security was like what Bonnie and Clyde said when someone asked them why they robbed banks, because that's where the money is. If you want to do something about the budget, you have to address the largest line items in the budget, which are Social Security and Medicare. I'd love us to have an expert on these programs who can explain how the funding actually works. It might not be quite so simple as looking at the line, uh, line items in the budget and saying, oh, cut this. There's different funding mechanisms for, for these different features of, of, of US government. But um, certainly, it does appear to be quite a sincere thing on the part of many Republicans that these programs need to be affected, changed, reformed, uh, because we see how they've continued to focus on it despite their awareness of how po- politically unpopular that is. So I think that we can kind of look at it as a very sincere ambition, but one in which in recent years, they are, or especially this year, less likely to kind of politically acknowledge. What Rick Scott is saying is, no, I don't, I'm not proposing cutting the programs. I'm proposing setting them up to sunset. And then every five years, we can just have a vote and and keep them in place. I don't think that that's very palatable to many people. The idea that these programs would be at risk every five years. We've seen the way Congress behaves on items like this, about how suddenly it becomes a political football, like the debt ceiling, something that can be held hostage to try to get a little bit of an edge here or there. We've also seen how Many members of Congress seem to be increasingly unserious about the responsibilities of government. Uh, The people of the Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gaetz ilk, who might not feel like they have much personally at stake in the survival of these programs, who go a little bit too far when they have the opportunity to create a hostage of of, of an important program and might, in fact, push it over the edge because... Uh, they're somewhat nihilistic and unserious about those responsibilities. It's not hard to imagine a scenario where if the programs had to have an affirmative vote to be uh, re-upped, so to speak, um, those sorts of people would have enough space and a voice in Congress to actually push it over the edge. I don't think that's a scenario that people want. And the Republicans themselves keep on talking about how they want to make the corporation tax cut permanent rather than sunsetting, they seem to understand the difference between permanence and sunsetting, right? Yeah. I mean, of course they do, John. Sunsetting was a way that 
the Tea Party House Freedom Caucus members were trying to attack all sorts of different programs when, when I was back at being a policy advisor. Heck, you even had proposals around the renewable fuel standards, which we don't need to get into to bore the audience. But essentially, it's a mandating a percent of ethanol that needs to be put into our nation's gasoline supply. And there's a huge contention about that. And there are valid arguments against maintaining this program. But politically, similar to Medicare and Social Security, you can't do anything with this program because it benefits Iowa. What is the first on the presidential calendar in in recent history for both Democrats and Republicans, although that's going to change for Democrats, in their primary? Iowa. So you could never really credibly come out against this program. And folks that did, like Ted Cruz, immediately flip-flopped once they ran in the primary. But that aside, John, I think the the real thing to note here is how big of a political win this was for Biden and blunder for the Republicans, because already it is setting up fault lines. You had President Donald Trump come out, I think before the speech, but certainly after the speech, saying Republicans should not touch Social Security and Medicare. And I know he always says everything about every single issue, but his political instinct was to immediately come out, stake out the lane of defender of Social Security, Medicare in the Republican primary. This is going to be an issue that dogs candidates like Mike Pompeo and Ron DeSantis in the Republican primary for president because these folks have votes that support cutting Medicare and Social Security back from Paul Ryan being the speaker. And probably even before that, we'd have to go through uh, the records. But that just goes to show you that Biden elevating this issue is not only something that will help Democrats in 24 in the Senate and the House and, and the White House, but will have a material impact on the 2024 Republican presidential race. Yeah, Justin, just like you've said, the Trump years were a bit unusual in American politics for many reasons, partly because this consistent feature of American politics went away from the front of mind. Uh, There was almost a truce on the issue of Medicare and Social Security during the Trump years. And Trump did not spend a lot of time talking about it, drawing attention to it. He did not declare his hostility to those programs. He forced Paul Ryan to abandon his dream of the balanced budget. So Trump himself does not have the same vulnerability on this topic other than his Republican Party affiliation, which still matters. It's led, like we were talking about before, many seniors to be consistent Democratic voters. Uh, but otherwise, he does not have, it appears like a particular personal vulnerability on this other than his Republican affiliation. However, every candidate who wants to run for president or an, any other office who was around before the Trump years, anyone who was involved in Republican Party politics during the Boehner-Ryan era is going to have problematic quotes and votes on this issue. And this big vulnerability that the Republicans have that hurt them in the 2012 election, that uh, hurt them in the 2000 election, that hurt them in the 2008 election, and so on and so on, is suddenly very, very relevant again. And I think the theme is rather consistent. And I can only speak, John, from 2013 forward from personal experience. But in a lot of these instances, these votes on Social Security and Medicare, which were dead on arrival, were taking place because the far right wing of the Republican Party mandated that they get these votes in backroom negotiations so that they could go home. And also in doing so, it forced a lot of maybe maybe they believe in these policies, maybe they don't, but it forced a lot of conservatives that weren't part of the Freedom Caucus also to go on the record with a vote. And what a member of Congress tells you they believe in a theoretical world and what they wish they could do with spending, it doesn't really mean shit until they put their name on the record and actually vote on it. Um, So this is just a microcosm, which extends itself back from the Tea Party of 2012, 2013, all the way to the recent State of the Union. 
where how did this come about? You had the House Freedom Caucus members heckling the president, and it ultimately got this issue to be blown out of proportion. Instead of being a throwaway line in a speech that we all forget, it is now the main thing. And not only are we talking about it, but Rick Scott's out there, Mike Rounds is out there, Mitch McConnell's out there. They're all talking about it. McCarthy, for example, is just denying it. And everybody knows in politics, it's really the attack that resonates no matter how true or not the attack is, it resonates usually a lot more than the defense just because of the way campaigning and psychology and society works itself out. Um, so, so that is to say that the, the crazy thing here is this is just one example in the beginning of the 118th Congress where the Republican Party was put in a disadvantage because of the Marjorie Taylor Greene and House Freedom Caucus members we are gearing up for two full years of this type of self-inflicted wound. What you're just saying really draws into focus the consequences of governing responsibility and the consequences of being in the majority. Because when the Republicans were in the minority in the last Congress, they could say, we're against wasteful spending, theoretically, without having to be specific. This is the luxury of opposition. You can say that you're against something in a very vague way, uh, but it's not really up to you to fix it. It's not really up to you to really put on the line exactly what your own idea is and what you really do support. And this is, since Republicans have won the majority and now have to actually govern the House of Representatives, they can no longer rely on this anymore. We're seeing with the upcoming debt ceiling vote, McCarthy and others on the Republican side know that they want to push for budgetary changes that the Democrats opposed and make some kind of deal over the debt ceiling. But what they're finding is they're not prepared to really be very specific about what they're asking for. And that is unsustainable. If they want to have a negotiation with the Democrats about this vote, They need to clarify what they're actually trying to achieve. If you want budget cuts in exchange for raising the debt ceiling, you want to negotiate about it, you have to tell us what budget cuts you're asking for. And that's when you get into the tricky stuff. In opposition, you can just say that you think the budget is too big. But when it's up to you to write the budget and make the deal on the budget, you have to get specific. And the politics of budgets and austerity and cuts are so difficult because almost everyone in America probably agrees that there's too much spending, especially at a time of inflation. But when you start looking at the actual spending items, all of them have a constituency behind them, especially something like Medicare and Social Security, which like we've said, tens of millions of people rely on. But even the smaller things, you know, cutting money from the science budget, cutting money from infrastructure spending, cutting military spending, on and on and on and on. Every single item in the budget is helping somebody. And it's really hard to find areas in the budget that are politically palatable to target for cuts. And when the Republicans were in the opposition, they didn't have to deal with this problem, but now they do. Yeah. And just to give folks a broad or vague picture of what we're talking about. The numbers that I'm looking up, Medicare is 12% of the US budget. Social Security is 21% of the US budget. That's 33% that the Republicans have taken off the table. Defense is another 10% of the US budget, roughly. That's almost 50% of US spending that the GOP it just does not want to cut or be seen attempting to cut or really reform. Uh, So then that leaves you your question, where are you going to get these other budget cuts from? And you have folks like Matt Gates, and I don't know if Marjorie Taylor Greene, I know Matt Gates was on Steve Bannon's podcast and he said, well, we're going to go after Medicaid and SNAP. So Medicaid is what lower income Americans receive for healthcare from the government. It's one form. And SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, is food stamps. And SNAP gets passed in the Farm Bill. 
So what he's saying is we are going to try and make the life of the most vulnerable amongst us more difficult. And while this may resonate with, and if they don't go, John, after spending from these two programs, and SNAP's really not that big percent of the budget, I don't know what type of big spending cuts they're going to be able to advance or advocate for or find. It's just not going to be uh, probably amount to much of their savings um, that, that they claim that they need. So, so that is to say, John, they are in a very difficult position where now they've left themselves because Social Security and Medicare are off the table, right? According to the State of the Union, they've left themselves fighting over defense funding when the whole country is freaked out about Chinese balloons. That's not good. Russia's raging a war in Ukraine, probably not going to uh, be a winner for, for the Republicans. And if they don't do that, then they're going to attack money for poor people. And at the end of the day, independent voters, moderate voters, generally speaking across the United States, my understanding of our fellow citizens is they're not cruel and that they do understand going through your life, you're going to run into some awful circumstances. And sometimes when you do run into those awful circumstances, it would be helpful if the government were to provide some type of social safety net. Uh, I think that generally speaking, a lot of conservatives, independents, moderates agree that there should be some type of safety net for our most unfortunate uh, folks out there. And this is all to say that even if you try and frame this up in a pretty little box, it's going to be a political loser for those undecideds out there. People don't want to vote for people, generally speaking, that are just cruel assholes. At this point, I think even most maybe not most, but many Democrats would begrudgingly acknowledge that there was too much public spending during the COVID pandemic, right? We're seeing how the inflation has been an issue. The amount of money, we were talking about this with Michael Strain, the amount of money that was spent is really incredible. It's almost difficult to fathom how much it dwarfs what was spent in the 2008, post-2008 financial crisis and it was john it was just tranche after tranche after tranche of trillions of dollars yeah i think there were at least three separate very significant was it four very significant major spending packages each of which was larger than the sum total of what was spent in recovering from the 2008 financial crisis so was there too much spending the last few years i think we're getting close to a consensus that there was um, however, the Democrats have lost their majority and perhaps at some level, partly for all the reasons that we're describing, they're kind of happy to have done so. They had no plans for another huge package like that one. And now they don't have to explain why they need to change track on that. So we're not talking about cutting back on those kinds of huge packages that that pushed the deficit so high the last few years, right? That's not on the table anyway. Now we're just on to the ordinary fiscal year and the ordinary budget process. And this is where it gets tricky. Waste, fraud, and abuse doesn't get you there. If you want to get closer to a balanced budget, you need to be specific and you need to tackle the big items. And doing so is not politically palatable. You know what is a way to to, to close the gap? We're, we talk so much about I think spending. I know where you're going, and I think I might agree with you. It's on the other side of the ledger, John. It's revenue. Revenue, yeah. <laughs> but we don't talk about that so much in American politics, uh, especially uh, in a period of divided government where the Republicans have control of one of the chambers of Congress. But John, I think that it's a vitally important conversation to have, right? So- There are multiple ways you can raise revenue. Uh, And I I think that, John, if we were to sit down with, you know, staffers on the Hill and we were to look at budgets, we'd be able to find some waste, fraud and abuse. It certainly wouldn't be in the trillions of dollars. But there are programs that could be reformed, pilot programs that worked really well, that could be made national, maybe save some money there, cut some other pilot programs, uh, and then just go through and, and try and tighten things up. I don't think austerity measures are appropriate when folks are concerned that we're going to be going into a recession in 2023. Um, but, you know, good faith efforts at spending reforms can be made. 
However, revenue. Right now, we are at a historic employment rate, and we need more workers to fill jobs. So one way to do that would be liberalizing immigration. That, that could be a way of increasing revenue because you're increasing the efficiency of companies, you're increasing the tax revenue. Um, so that's a common sense way of approaching things that's dead on arrival. Another way of looking at it would be what President Biden outlined in the State of the Union, which I think you were alluding to, would be raising taxes on Americans that make over $400,000 a year, and specifically a billionaire tax. And to me, it just makes... So, so I understand if you are a Republican or an independent and you're making a lot of money and you don't want your taxes raised. Sure, vote that way. That's less than 1% of the whole entire US population is making that much money. Um, but if you're looking at this from a logical standpoint, if you agree that we have spent too much in the past, that we should work towards getting the budget under control, maybe not a balanced budget, but like Michael Strain said, a more sustainable budget where we're just taking in more money and spending less um, so that over time it kind of finds its equilibrium, then you'd have to be uh, intellectually dishonest, maybe stupid to not advocate for a tax on the most wealthy amongst us, billionaires, folks making 10 million plus. Yet there is so much staunch opposition to this line of thinking and the Republicans control the House that this isn't even being discussed really in media because it's dead on arrival. I'm a little bit skeptical of some of your argument there, Justin. I think that talking about the highest income earners, the ones that are at the level that you're describing, people are making over 400000 and so on. It's a little easy, isn't it? I think that this is almost like the Democratic Party's mirror image of the Republican idea that we can balance the budget without making hard choices about what to cut. I don't think there's really any easy choices here. I don't think that we can only go after billionaires or people making more than half a million and get that much closer to having a balanced budget. I think that there might need to be more substantial taxation revenue increases to get us there. I think taxing corporations more would be also a potential way to get into this. I, I think that there is a sweet spot maybe from the 21% that was passed under President Trump from the 35% that it was, maybe there's some wiggle room in there. I think you can close loopholes. I know that I'm being very vague. I'm not a tax expert here, but a lot of companies offshore things, they get around taxes. I think that taxing the wealthiest amongst us and increasing taxes on corporations in a measured and logical way would certainly go a lot further than screaming from the hilltops for cutting programs and cutting the U.S. budget when you're not willing to look at 50% of the budget. 